In this video, we look at molecules and molecular compounds in more detail. We'll start by reminding ourselves that a molecule is a definite and distinct group of non-metal atoms chemically bonded together by covalent bonds. If we were able to use a microscopic pair of tweezers on the atomic scale, we would be able to pluck out a single definite and discrete water molecule from a glass of water. This is not the case for ionic compounds where no discrete molecules exist. The atoms in a molecule are chemically bonded in a specific way, resulting in a definite structure and definite shape. To represent molecules and molecular compounds, we often need to refer to several types of chemical formulas, including the molecular formula, the structural formula, and the empirical formula. We will use the formula C4H10 to demonstrate the differences and importance of each. As shown here, C4H10 is a molecular formula which gives the exact number of different atoms of an element in a molecule. And while this is very useful, it is also somewhat limited as it does not give us any indication on the structure or the order of attachment of atoms. And it gives us no information about the shape of the molecule. And both of these characteristics are very important in determining the overall chemical and physical properties of molecules. It turns out that the C4H10 molecular formula is the molecular formula for two different molecular compounds, butane and methylpropane. Different compounds with the same chemical formulas are said to be isomers of each other. While butane and methylpropane are isomers and have the same molecular formulas, they have quite different structures and have very different chemical and physical properties. To determine exactly which of the two isomers of C4H10 we might be dealing with in any particular circumstance, we use the structural formula to help out. The structural formula for butane has four carbon atoms attached in a chain, with the ten peripheral hydrogen atoms attached to the carbons. The structural formula for methylpropane has three carbons attached in a chain, with the fourth carbon attached to the central carbon of the three carbon chain. The 10 hydrogen atoms are again attached peripherally to the four carbon atoms. Clearly, these two molecules have quite different structures and quite different orders of attachment of atoms. And that's exactly what structural formulas do. They provide more information with regard to the order of attachment of atoms. The downside to structural formulas is that they are more cumbersome to use and represent in, for example, chemical equations. So whether you use the molecular formula or the structural formula will depend on the situation you are using it for and what type of information you wish to convey. A third important type of chemical formula that's used to characterize molecular compounds is the empirical formula. And the empirical formula gives only the relative number of each type of atom in the compound, not necessarily the exact number. The empirical formula for C4H10 is C2H5, which is the lowest whole number ratio of the elements involved. It should be noted that the compound C2H5 does not actually exist as a molecule with those exact numbers of atoms, and this is typical of many empirical formulas. The empirical formula is therefore only showing the relative numbers of atoms, and the subscripts in an empirical formula are always the smallest whole number ratio of the atoms in the molecule. It therefore follows that the subscripts in the actual molecular formula are always whole number multiples of the subscripts in the empirical formula. So we can see that we've got a 2 as a subscript in the empirical formula for carbon. We multiply that by 2 and get 4 as a subscript in the actual chemical formula. For hydrogen, that we can see that we've got 5 as a subscript for hydrogen in the empirical formula. We multiply that by 2 as well and we get 10 as a subscript in the actual molecular formula. We can use glucose here as another example, which has the empirical formula of CH2O or C1H2O1. If we multiply the subscripts in the empirical formula by 6, we get the molecular formula for glucose as C6H12O6, which is a whole number multiple of all the subscripts involved. Now, while the molecular formula, structural formula, and empirical formula give important information about molecules, they actually give very little information about the size, shape, and the distribution of electrons within the molecule. And this is important because it's the size, shape, and electron distribution that dictate most physical and chemical properties of molecular substances. So we can use other ways to represent molecules to give us even more information. Here we see four different representations of the methane molecule, CH4. We've already seen the structural formula, which gives information on the order of attachment of atoms. We've also got perspective drawings, we've got ball and stick models, and we've got space filling models. 
A perspective drawing has solid lines representing chemical bonds in the plane of the page. Solid wedges are used to represent bonds that extend out from the plane of the page. And dashed wedges are used to represent bonds that go behind the plane of the page. In ball and stick models, balls of different colours and sizes are used to represent different atoms, while the bonds between them are represented by cylindrical sticks. While useful for showing the order of attachment of atoms and the overall geometry or shape of the bonds involved, and even the angles between atoms, the ball and stick model does not describe the true shape of molecules. The covalent bond that binds atoms in a molecule are not actually stick-like, but are the result of the sharing of electrons from electron clouds of each atom involved in the bond. For this reason, space-filling models are best for estimating the overall shape of a molecule and are used to demonstrate the relative size and shape of the electron cloud of each atom involved in the molecule. They also show the extent of overlap of these electron clouds in the covalent bonds holding the molecule together. This table here represents some further examples of some other common molecular compounds with different representations showing the name, the molecular formula, the empirical formula, the structural formula, a ball and stick model, and a space filling model for each of the compounds. Whichever one of these representations you use will depend on exactly what type of information you wish to convey. So far, all of the examples we've used for molecules have been molecular compounds, but molecular elements also exist. Now remember, an element is comprised of only one type of atom, and so molecular elements can be said to be a definite and distinct group of a single type of atom chemically bonded by covalent bonds. Examples we need to know about include molecular hydrogen, H2, the oxygen molecule, O2, and the nitrogen molecule, N2. These are probably the three most important molecular elements that we deal with. Others include the halogens, fluorine, F2, chlorine, Cl2, bromine, Br2, and iodine, I2. A couple of unusual ones include the phosphorus molecule, P4, and the sulfur molecule, S8. So just be aware that molecules are not just molecular compounds, they can also be molecular elements. A final way of describing molecules is to classify them as either binary molecules, diatomic molecules, or polyatomic molecules. Binary molecules are molecules containing only two types of atoms. Diatomic molecules contain exactly two atoms, and polyatomic molecules contain three or more atoms. If we have a look at these representations of some common molecules, we would see that these four molecules would be examples of binary polyatomic compounds. Binary meaning two types of atoms within a molecule and polyatomic meaning three or more atoms in total. Carbon monoxide would be an example of a binary diatomic molecule containing two types of atoms and exactly two atoms. We've got diatomic elemental molecules molecules containing exactly two atoms and being elements because they contain only one type of atom in their structure. And we have a polyatomic elemental molecule here, ozone or O3, being a second allotrope of elemental oxygen.